Good afternoon. I'm going to ask everyone to just have a seat. We are about to start. Um, I appreciate if you guys could use the front chairs so we, um, uh, when people come later on, we have a space for them to sit down. So if the people in the back move to the front, I really appreciate it. Yeah, you can sit on the reserves. It's, there is nobody in front of you. Just on the second, on the second one, on the second row. Yeah. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, my name is John Moreno Escobar. I, I work with the City University of New York and I, I'm wearing two hats today. I actually work with the um, Senior Vice Chancellor of a Student um, of, of, um, of University Affairs and the Vice Chancellor of a Student Affairs. And I also uh, represent the Columbian Education Fund as the founder and former president. Um, and I'm here delighted to present uh, the first study that has been done for Colombians in the metropolitan area. Um, we're going to have a really short uh, beginning of the of the program. Uh, the first thing, of course, will be uh, our national anthem from Colombia, and then the American anthem, and then we will start the program with um, the speakers that you have on, on the agenda. If you could rise, thanks. <laughs>
Good evening. Thank you for coming to be with us this afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, the, General, the Consul General of Colombia, New York, Maria Isabel Nieto. Her last position was as the private pre secretary and presidential advisor of President Juan Manuel Santos. Maria Isabel Nieto is a lawyer from the, Univers from the Universidad de los Andes in Bogotá and pursued studies in political science from the Inst El Instituto de Estudios Políticos de Paris before returning to the public sector as private secretary of President Santos. She was director of government affairs of Bavaria and South Miller. She's married to Jorge Muñoz and has two children, Josefina and Emilio. Please join me well to welcome the Consul of Colombia in New York. Thank you very much, Carmen. It is an honor to have Colombians like you in such a great positions. She's the Dean of Business, Business Art, Arts, and Social Science, Bergen Community College in New Jersey, okay. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, <clears throat> uh, John and Cole for inviting me. Um, and especially, thank you, Professor. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the name. <laughs> Burgard. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> um, for you and your team, of course, on behalf of the Colombian community, on behalf of the Colombian government, uh, for conducting this study. I want to start saying that I couldn't be happier. Um, the important mission that we have as consuls is uh, besides, of course, of issuing passports, IDs, and visas, is to look after our Colombian citizens and help them in any way we can to lighten their burden by giving them the tools, the necessary tools, to improve their quality of life, especially of those in need. Although the Colombian community has many leaders from diverse backgrounds who have helped us identify where should we address our efforts. This study complements perfectly with knowledge and data, the experience of our leaders. Now I understand much better how the Colombians came to New York, how they arrived, when and why. For the first time I can understand the composition of a typical Colombian family. What are their dreams? It's so nice to know, for example, that among the Latino community, the Colombians are those that present higher education levels and the lower levels of dropouts of school, which shows how those who came 20 or 30 years ago understood the importance of giving their children, Colombians or uh, uh, Americans with Colombian fathers, the kind of educations and opportunities that baby they didn't have. I mentioned this only as an example uh, uh, of, the, of what the study professor is giving us. Uh, we really have the information uh, that we need to design better the projects that we are addressing or uh, giving our community. Our citizens in New York have helped the Colombian economy to grow through the remittances, but also by keeping the Colombian culture alive. Although we have far away, although we are far away from home, but Colombians have also contributed to build this society, and thanks to them, uh, with a, our reputation as Colombians have changed. Now we are um, known to be committed and hardworking people, creative with innovation, and, uh, and most of all, cheerful people. So I couldn't really be prouder to represent my community, my country, my government. And um, thank you, Professor, again, John, y que viva Colombia. Well, now I am going to present the founder of the Colombian Education Fund, John Moreno Escobar. 
John is a successful social entrepreneur, community leader, and executive innovator. His passion is education, equality, and access to higher education for all. John is a neighbor Colombian from Bogota and who recently was appointed to lead the urban initiatives at the City University of New York, CUNY. So welcome, John. Um, so I'm not gonna extend on the remarks of the Council General. Um, I do want to um, address a couple of things. Um, we, a couple of years ago, had this dream of creating the first educational fund for Colombians in the world. It was, that was the idea. We uh, gathered together with different entrepreneurs and educators like Dr. Carmen and the former Consul General of that time to really find out a way to provide resources, not just about money, but resources to the Colombian community. And it's thanks to um, the government who's, who's still here uh, next to us, um, the City University of New York, um, led by the Dr. Jay Hershenson, our Senior Vice Chancellor, um, and corporations like HNL Black, which I'm pleased to see here today, and Emmanuel Diaz, um, have been able to, to really provide um, resources to our community. We are the only foundation in the United States that provides scholarships to Colombian students, Colombian students they have been here in the United States or Colombian students that were born here in the United States from Colombian parents. There is three challenges that we feel in the community of Colombians that we feel at the Colombian Education Fund we have to face. The first one is they, they see the community more unite. And I think that's one of our biggest um, missions at the Colombian Education Fund. I personally have been through three different council generals. Uh, I have been here for 13 years and I have experienced how our community has been divided by many other issues, specifically political. And I think that education is the only thing that could help us to unite our community. I see here faces of different backgrounds, of different, different political views that represent the diversity of our community. And I think that education has a big role on uniting our community. We have students that don't know about our political parties in Colombia, they don't know about the colors of the political parties that come to our foundation with dreams of being successful and graduating from college. And we believe at the Colombian Education Fund that education is the only way we will reunite our community or a strength parts of the community that needs to be united. The second part has to be with the role of every other leader that is uh, part of our community. Here, sitting today, we have the first Colombian appointee by the Governor Cuomo, and I'm gonna ask Julissa Gutierrez to stand up. She's there, she's humble, but Julissa um, was, appointed, was appointed not too long ago to uh, direct the community outreach of the governor, and it, I'm really pleased to see her here, but also we have people like Dr. Carmen and other uh, amazing figures that we're not in, in the picture of working with the Colombian community. Now we have them here at the Colombian Education Fund participating in our meetings, participating in our events, and getting involved with our youth, which is really important. And the last one, and the most important one, I think, is the value of these studies. I do want to thank Professor Lagar for, uh, for his um, uh, leadership on this. We met a couple of uh, months ago, maybe more than a month ago with him, and um, he told us that he, uh, that he was really delighted to do this, um, but we had an, a, a funding issue. We didn't have the money to provide um, the community with this, with this um, study, uh, and it was thanks to, uh, to him and to the vi Senior Vice Chancellor Jay Hershenson, which, which I want you to get this in your mind. He is the, the biggest advocate of our community out there. He put the funding through the university to make this a study possible. And as the Council General was mentioning, this will give us a better picture to understand our community. We knew that our community was um, big in Queens, but we didn't know that our community was actually located in, in a bigger picture outside of New York City. And uh, Professor will explain a little bit about that. We knew that we were entrepreneurs, 
but we didn't know the income that we have after our education. So there is many results in this study that show the capacity of our community, that show the tenacity of many immigrants of Colombian descent who come here, like I did, with $100 in our pockets, trying to go through different hardships, but because of education, again, which is the key, and thanks to this university who has opened the doors to thousands of Colombian students to graduate and go to Wall Street, graduate and go and open their own businesses, it's, it's, it's those experiences, the ones that we want to replicate at the fund. So uh, thank you for being here today, and now it's my honor to introduce uh, the distinguished professor, Larry Bergard. He is the director of the Center of Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies from CUNY Graduate Center, and he's distinguished professor at the Herbert H. Lehman College. Let me welcome with an applause to Dr. <laughs> professor Bergard. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John, for coming to my office whenever it was. It was more than a few months ago and asking me to do this report. Now, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to present you with a dizzying array of data, information, statistical information. And the instinct of most people when they are presented with data is to yawn and fall asleep and say, when is this guy going to finish? <laughs> But what I want to uh, implore to you is that all this data does is tell a story, or a number of stories. And these stories are supported by scientific information, uh, not uh, uh, anecdotal evidence. And so I think that's the purpose of presenting hard data. So when I present all of these bar charts and all of these statistics, don't yawn understand that I'm going to try to explain the story behind them, okay? And we're going to conduct this like we conduct a class. Anyone who has any questions, as I'm speaking, because I'm inventing this ex contemporaneously, as you see, uh, raise your hand, and I'll try to answer your question, okay? So let's begin. We've got the ground rules here. No boredom, and ask questions if you don't understand something. All right. We're not studying New York City, we're studying the New York metropolitan area for a very simple reason. The majority of Colombians in the area do not live in Queens, do not live within the city confines, they live outside of New York City. That may have not been the case in 1980 or 1990, it's certainly the case today as we will see. First thing we're going to study is or look at is demography, or the study of the Colombian population. Now, what we see here in the New York metropolitan area, you can hear me if I don't use this, I like to dance. You can all hear me back there? Yeah. I don't like to be confined to a microphone. Now, what you see here is that the Colombian population grew fairly substantially between 1980 and 2000, and then leveled off. The reasons for this, as we'll see very shortly in some other slides, is very simple. Can't hear? What? What's that? Oh, they can't do a stream? Oh, I'm, just, I'm, pri I'm prisoner of the microphone here. Okay, that's okay. I'm prisoner of many things, but uh, <clears throat> micro microphones are the least of my preoccupations here. What you see is the Colombian population has really leveled off between 2000 and 2010, and there are two reasons. One, a d steep decline in immigration flows. That is, less numbers of Colombians are arriving in a metropolitan area. One. Two. And we will see this statistically in a moment. The Colombian population among Latinos has the lowest birth rate, or the lowest in scientific terms, general fertility rate, of any group uh, of Latinos in the New York metropolitan area. So not only are we seeing a decline in immigration, but we are not seeing a, any process of demographic or population expansion because of natural reproduction, as would be the case if we looked at Dominicans uh, or Mexicans, to give you two examples. Now, what, this, what these pie charts show is the distribution of the population, and the red here is the percentage of the overall Colombian population that lived in New York City. The other colors are the percentage of Colombians that live outside of the city. And what you see here is a very clear trend. Back in 1990, 56% of the population lived, Colombian population lived within the city, all the way up to 2010, 
it declined to 45%. So we find this process of what we can refer to as suburbanization, people leaving the city. When one thinks of Colombians, one thinks of Queens. That's not the case anymore, all right? Uh, here are some, now, and no one has to memorize these statistics. I'm not giving you a multiple choice test or true false, but you can see here that the greatest concentration of Colombians is indeed in Queens. But look at the suburban counties. If we added all those up, any of you math majors can do this in your head, you will see that many more Colombians live in the suburban counties at the top than live in Queens. So once again, Colombians are distributed throughout the metropolitan area. The epicenter may be Queens, but we have this fairly diversified settlement patterns. We'll talk about why momentarily. Now, here again, we're going back to the theme of why the Colombian population is stagnant in terms of overall growth in the area. These are foreign-born Colombians, people born in Colombia, and you can see that are living in the New York metropolitan area in 2010. You can see that there's a constant stream of arrivals from the 1950s all the way up to 2000, and then arrivals abruptly decline. Whether that is linked to decreased job opportunities here, or whether it's linked to more political stability and the decline of violence in Colombia is something that sociologists, anthropologists should explore. I'm presenting some of the data, but there's without question the data shows a decline in Colombian migration. All right, now, we don't have to look at all these bars. Let's look at the far right one. One of the very interesting aspects of Colombian migration to the New York metropolitan area is the predominance of women. If we look at the peer, this period, 60 years between 1951 and 2010, we see that nearly 58% of all the migrants coming here are women. What does that suggest? All right. It suggests that, that quite interestingly, we'd find a different profile if we looked at other groups. We, it suggests, number one, that there's probably not family migration here. Women are coming here at a very young age to look for work because they are entrusted for a variety of reasons to support their families in Colombia and the new families they're going to make here in New York when they arrive. So we have a predominance of women. This is not common. Okay. Uh, oh my. Uh, this is a very technical chart, but what it shows you is that most of the, this is an age structured, age pyramid chart. What it shows you here is that most of the migrants coming and women are on the right side in black are in the working age categories. You see, between 30 and 59, that's where the migrants are, 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 are concentrated, actually between 30 and 49, all right? Very few children coming, very small number of children. Remember I just said before, it's not families that are coming here. It's basically single people who are coming here to look for work and maybe support their families back home. Down below, you have this sex ratio. Sex ratio is the number of men per hundred women. You know how, no, I don't want this to be misconstrued, but I'm always hearing this, there are no men out there. <laughs> well, it's true. It's statistically borne out by the evidence. Uh, there are a hundred women for every 73 men. And that's a reflection of the migration. All right, remember I said that Colombians were not reproducing naturally. There's no natural reproduction. Here is, no, I don't mean that they're not, they're not birth. I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, don't say anything that I, I don't, I don't want to make any facetious statements that may be misinterpreted or get me thrown in jail. Or at least, but what you see here, Colombians, of course, women are giving birth. But what we see is the statistical indicators show the lowest crude birth rates and general fertility rates of any group. Now, look at the difference between Mexicans, for example, and Colombians. It's about half. Which is why the Mexican population of the New York metropolitan area is growing by leaps and bounds, not simply because Mexicans are arriving, because they're reproducing. Why is this the case? What's the explanation? Birth control. As we're going to see later on, Colombian population of the region, especially women, are the most educated of all of the Latino national subgroups in the area. And education leads to a knowledge of how to prevent pregnancy, if you want to, all right? 
whereas a poor Mexican woman from rural Puebla comes here without any understanding of birth control whatsoever, and that's a, st a bit of a stereotypical image of Mexicans, but it's why you have such high fertility rates and high birth rates. In any event, this is the scientific proof. All right, another phenomenon related to women of extreme importance here, the number of Colombian households headed by women. Look at how this has grown really meteorically between 1990 and 2010. Back in 1990, if we looked at the metropolitan area of New York, a third of all households were headed, yeah, Colombian households were headed by women, nearly half in 2010. So something is going on here, right? Uh, this is not typical. You Colombian women are something, I'll tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed here. I'm not going to go any further than that with these comments, although I could. All right, now another aspect of the Colombian population is that it is an older population when examined in comparative perspective with the other Latino groups in the city. Now, this is, these are just data, these are just indicators, but we find an older population. That is related to the fact of low birth rates. If you had high birth rates, you'd have a large number of children and the median age would be less. So, there are very important implications of this. Again, you raise your hands if you have any questions. All right, now we're gonna to get to the most interesting theme of economics, which I'm sure you've all been waiting for with bated breath. Uh, are you ready? Any questions on demography? None whatsoever. Yes, we have a question. I guess <clears throat> something that you say about, because it's very political, when you say that Colombian has been reduced between 2000 and 2010, have been reduced coming to the States, to New York. And, and, and for me, it's a very political issue because <clears throat> between 2004 and 2008 was the worst time period of more displays and killings in Colombia. So there was a lot of displacement in that period of time. And then I think the way we can present that is people not coming to New York because they're going to Florida instead of coming to New York. And I think that would be a better excuse to say why people are not coming to New York, but not to say that because polit political issues in Colombia are getting better. Because okay. the truth is Thank you for your, for your comment, and I'll take that under consideration, but let, let's make very clear here. I'm analyzing and reporting particular data that is found in government documents published by the United States Census Bureau here. I do not have access to these other kinds of information which may be as important or more important. So it is up to someone else to take this to the next level of analysis. I'm providing the basic information that we have. I'm not going into the analytical framework for explaining this. Just a follow up to this last comment. Uh -huh. Hypothetically speaking, if you did a study of Miami today, would it be similar to the statistic on Columbia, Colombians living in Miami? Would it be similar to your statistics and demographics that you I found? have no clue, but I certainly am capable, I'm perfectly capable of doing a study of Miami, or for that matter, Colombians anywhere in the United States. But I haven't done that, and so I can't, I can't anticipate what the data would reveal. So it's, it's impossible. Thank you. I, I just don't know, because I haven't crunched the numbers, but I can. Question back there. Oh, question over here, apparently. Yes. Uh, what, was, did you, what was the percentage that you say of women, uh, the Colombian women that immigrated uh, in, New York, in New York City? Close to 60%, New York metropolitan area, close to 60% close to of arrivals here were female. Thank you. Whereas if, for example, if you'd look at Mexicans today, about two thirds would be male. So there's a different anthropological and sociological background to migration. Why is it? Now that's a question that I can't answer from the data. I would like to be able to, but that's another uh, study. Well, we're, we're, we're a little short of time, so let's go to another question here, if you don't mind. Afterwards, you can make as many comments as you want. 
Um, quick question on the counties that you chose in New Jersey. So why were those certain counties chosen versus other ones, like Morris County? Why was what? I'm sorry? Why were the counties in New Jersey? How were they selected versus other counties? Well, I selected counties where you had the greatest concentrations of Colombians, essentially. There are other counties where there are Colombians, but if there were 12 Colombians or 13 Colombians or 20 Colombians, I didn't feel it was worth. This is the New York generally considered the New York metropolitan area, so that's why I selected those counties. Again, this is arbitrary. Someone else can come along and say, oh, this Brigade, he has no idea what he's doing, we forgot to conclude uh, blah, 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 and you know, and then I'll crush them with my intellect. But anyways, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have a question related to your gender issues, and um, uh, you mentioned that most women who come here are single, single, I young women. Young women, but you know, I don't, you didn't say anything about if they were single, married, or divorced. Well, that's a, I think that's a very interesting question, and I did not uh, really run the numbers on that, although I do have the capability of figuring that one out. So let's file that away somewhere from my center to figure out. Yeah, I don't, I don't because know the, the reason. Answer. I would suspect it would be my educated guess from studying migration flows that most were single. Okay, yeah, because my question is related to oh, some studies that were conducted uh, more than 15 years ago about Colombians and comparing Colombian women and Dominican women, and they were showing how for Colombian women um, who were uh, married in Colombia and they came here, it was actually a very good improvement in terms of their relationships because they were escaping abusing Husbands. Yeah, you're, look, I, I think the point that you're making, and it's a very good point, there are a mosaic of motivational factors that cause people, whether they're women or men, to migrate from one place to another. And these are th very uh, uh, valid themes to explore. I didn't explore motivational factors here. So let me move on in the name of time, and we can revisit some let, of this. One last question. One last one last question. We're, we're going to uh, get this one last question. Just to clarify where the data are coming from, because you said government documents, and right. how do you select the, da the data and say that these are women and they're single or they're not? And uh, so I understand that today it's just an do you present in a statistical study that there's no way to go into analysis of why things are. Well, there is. Are, there okay. is a way. All right. That's Look, okay. Where are my sources? Where am I getting this information from? These come from the raw data files of millions of records issued by the United States Census Bureau and the decennial censuses of the United States. Now, what I do as a scholar and what I've been doing for many years is I take these data files which contain data on millions and millions of people and I have been working with a statistical analytical program which permits me to run what I call analytical queries to say, I want to know this, I want to know that, I want to know this, and I can segregate Colombians because of the fact that the Census Bureau and its sample data identifies people by nationality. So these are complex, you're not going to find this data anywhere, these data. These data do not exist anywhere but in this room and in this report because no one has ever conducted, I don't believe, uh, an analysis of these data sets. And I might also add, at the risk of boring you to tears, that these data sets are released yearly through the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. Now, I happen to have taken this study to 2010, but I have also looked at data from 2013, which is the last data set that is released. And so my center upstairs on the fifth floor uh, it devotes itself to ongoing research on Latino communities in the New York metropolitan area, among whom Colombians are the fifth largest, analyzing these data. We look at many different things, marriage patterns, intermarriage patterns, I mean, just, just everything. Okay? Can we, can we hold off and continue here and we'll come back to these things? I am uh, absolutely uh, enthralled that you have so many questions. <laughs> you see, I haven't discovered that questioning. Uh, I'm going to have to conduct a more detailed research project on this. All right. Economic performance. And I think as the consul noted from assiduously reading this report and the data, uh, uh, that Colombians among Latinos in the New York metropolitan area have the highest median incomes. Now, once again, 
these are just statistical indicators. Median is the middle point. It means a lot of Colombians make over $100,000 a year, all right? But what is key here is that, without question, their highest incomes are earned by the Colombian population of this tri-state area, all right? That's what we know from the, an analyzing the data. Now, uh, here we're starting to slice and dice some things. This can get a little bit dizzying here, uh, but we're seeing that uh, men, make more money than women, all right? Excuse me, women, 80,000 here. So what I've done is I've, I've divided the Colombian community, and this is at my discretionary point, those born here and those born in Colombia. And you see that those born in the United States earn more money, but that always, whether foreign born or domestic born, men earn more than women. So women had extraordinary number of households, but they earn less money overall, not in all instances, than men. Okay. Why? Sex discrimination in the workplace. We have no equal pay for equal work law in the United States, one of the only industrial countries in the world where this doesn't exist. It's shameful. Ask your Republican elected representatives. That was an editorial <laughs> comment, not me. Not, uh, okay, now, uh, now we're isolated. Serious here. I want no laughing out there. Uh, now we're isolating household heads. Now let's keep in mind these are those who head households. Let's look at the 2010 data. These are the trends. Once again, Colombian women head more as many households as men, but they earn less money. So this is a socioeconomic reality, and uh, I think that's going to even out now. Uh, this is again a dizzying statistical table, but it does show you something about Queens, doesn't it? Because when we say Colombia, we think Queens. I think Arepas, but we think Queens here. Uh, very low on the totem pole, pole of income earners. Up at the top, Look at the suburban counties. That's where people make more money. Is that so surprising, really? Who is moving to the suburbs? People who have more uh, acquisitive power. No, people who have higher incomes because they're looking to buy homes, live better lives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is this hierarchy of uh, income here, uh, median income in the region. All right, now this is another complex chart, but it essentially is isolating the percentage of households that earn more than $100,000 a year. And I just chose 100,000 arbitrarily. Someone said to me the other day, oh, 100,000, that's not much in New York. Well, tell that to someone who's earning $30,000 a year. What you're seeing here is that a higher percentage of Colombian households, nearly 31%, earn over $100,000 a year than any of the other Latino groups. Again, as the consul observed, we have a population that has a greater degree of success in income, in wealthier people, than the other Latino groups in the region. All right. Not nuclear rocket science here, but here's the data to show it. The more education you have, the more money you earn. Look at the difference. Do you know what that translates into over a lifetime of work? Over 25 or 30 years of work, what a college degree means? And I stopped with a BA or higher, because if I put a master's degree, People with master's degree earn 20% to 25% more than people with BA degrees. Once you get a PhD, you take a vow of poverty and you'll never have any money anyways. And so, and so forget about that, but ma master's degree is that. Okay, why am I putting this here? I'm putting this here because we're gonna turn to education next. Now, Let's look at the trajectory here. This is pretty impressive, but it only tells, but let's look down here. 
Percentage of the adult. Now, the way the Census Bureau, since you wanted to know sources, measures educational attainment is only for the population 25 years of age or older. The assumption is that your educational cycle will be completed by age of 25. That's not always the case. But what you see here is an extraordinary growth of college-educated Colombians. 20 years ago, only close to 11% had a BA degree or higher. That's almost a, nearly a quarter now. In fact, it's over a quarter today. There is a culture among Colombians that values education. This is very, very clear, and I'm going to present you with more data that is going to certainly back this up. At the same time, it's astounding to think that 40% of adults in 1990 who were Columbians had not even graduated high school. That declined precipitously, no? And then we have these other characteristics here which will bore you. Uh, once again, let's look at this uh, in a comparative perspective here. Uh, the blues, high college graduates, look at how Colombians compare to Puerto Ricans, Ecuadorians, Dominicans, and Mexicans. You see. Pardon me? You have the highest rates and you should be proud. Okay, we, okay, good. That's one of the purposes here. We're going to cheerlead here. So, again, what are the sociological, anthropological reasons behind valuing education? That's the job of someone else. That's not something that I'm looking at. Okay, now, this is even more astounding. Let's look at the BA or higher. Born in the United States. The overall rate of college graduation was 23%, but if you're born here in the U.S., it's close to 40%. Let me give you some data in comparative perspective about how impressive this is. And what this shows here, let me make a parenthetical digression and an observation. The American dream is not a myth. It's a reality. You study, you work hard, you get ahead. Doesn't mean there's not discrimination. Doesn't mean there's not racism. Those all exist in this society as we well know. But there are opportunities here and Colombians have taken advantage of them. Look at the foreign born, that is those born in Colombia, much less than those born in the United States. These are non-high school graduation rates as well. All right, let's complicate this even a little more. Let's look at domestic-born women. Even higher college graduation rates. See. Colombian women born here in the United States in the New York metropolitan area have an extraordinary college graduation rate. If we looked at the college graduation rate among non-Hispanic whites, Right, generally considered the elite here, correct? 48%. So Colombian women are approaching the college graduation rates of the dominant race ethnic group in the New York metropolitan area. You Colombian women are impressive, let me tell you. As I look out here, I am impressed. All right, men a little bit less, but still fairly impressive, no? Men are the red? The red or the men? The, the colors have no symbolic significance. Okay, they were arbitrarily chosen. All right. Uh, foreigners, foreign born males, foreign born females, lower rates. Uh, college graduation rates by place of residence. Queens. We always generalize about Queens and Colombians, don't we? But in fact, fairly low college graduation rate in comparative perspective. Now, that's the data. Brooklyn I found to be interesting, actually. I think they're all living in Brooklyn Heights and Park Slope. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Staten Island, fairly high, all right? Suburban counties, much higher college graduation rates.
Poverty. I know, we were having fun for a while, and here he goes, an agua fiesta uh, comes here. And let's look at poverty rates because the news isn't so bad. Colombians have the lowest poverty rates of any of the Latino groups. Look at the gold, that's 2010. There's been a decline. 12.6% of the Colombian population, as designated by the US Census Bureau, lives in poverty. Look at Dominicans, look at Mexicans, look at Puerto Ricans, look at Ecuadorians. Once again, socioeconomic advantage from a comparative point of view. You had a question there. Was the income required to... Hold on, let me give you the mic, because otherwise... Yeah. What was the minimum wage per year, like 20K? I know the question. I know the answer also. <laughs> You're asking me what the income is. There is no income. This is depending on the Census Bureau measures poverty by, it depends on family size, depends on household size. It's a sliding scale. What we are doing here is reporting the Census Bureau's designation. Are these designations 100% accurate? No. But from a comparative point of view, we see quite clearly that Colombians are less, there are less percentages of people. Whether this is off by a margin of error of 10 or 15 percent, meaning it could be 13 percent, it could be 13, we don't know. This is just indicative of something. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Interestingly enough, let's go, uh, well, I, uh, women do have higher rates of poverty, male, female, yes. They're still low in comparative perspective, but there's not that much difference between foreign-born and domestic-born, although you see the lowest poverty rates are among Colombians born in the United States, 10%. So what we're doing here is slicing and dicing the data, and you can examine the report if you're really interested in the nuances. Uh, I'm not seeing too many glazed eyes yet, so we're going to continue with this. And again, poverty rates by place, as you would expect, uh, poverty rates are higher in the city. An exception is Hudson County, but Hudson County is in many ways sociologically an extension of New York City because it's right across the river. All right. Again, an avalanche of data here. Uh, you can consult the report, and it, it can be downloaded for free from our website, the Center for Latin American Studies website. You can all get this for free in PDF format. All right, this will put you to sleep. Work. Uh, unemployment. Not so bad, not so impressive. Uh, a spike in 2010 in unemployment among Colombians, probably because of the economic crisis of two, that was begun in late 2008, 2009. Uh, compares a bit favorably to the other groups. Uh, not as low as Mexicans. Mexicans are the highest employed percentage of people, by the way, in the tri-state area. They earn the lowest salaries, but they work. Uh, people out of the workforce. These are people who are not looking for work. And I think this is kind of revealing, especially looking at the 2010 data here, lowest level of people not look out of the workforce. In other words, Colombians are out there looking for work. There may be some that are unemployed, but what this is identifies people who aren't looking for work. Now, that could be, quote, unquote, I don't want to offend anyone here, housewives, women who stay at home, or men who stay at home who aren't looking for work, or uh, perpetually unemployed people we don't know. Colombians work. And here is kind of a synopsis here. Um, uh, the total number of Colombians who work, 70%. Between 16 and 60 years of age, males, 76%, females, 66%. Again, these are data. They require more thought. They require more analysis. They are data that hopefully will stimulate some of you who are students or want to be students or no students to say, hey, this is an interesting piece of information. Let me explore this further. All right, language. Colombians speak English. Duh. All right. This is interesting because what I'm going to show you next. 
77% of all Colombians living in the area report speaking only English well or very well. That's English proficiency. After all, you're here listening to me to speak in English, and I'm going to tell you a little secret. Puedo dar este en español, si quiero. Se me da la gana, pero no lo voy a hacer, porque es más fácil en inglés para mí. All right, so. <laughs> However. <laughs> oh, this is a breakdown of, uh, obviously, domestic-born kids. Their English skills are extraordinary. Uh, and even adults are pretty good. Um, even foreign-born children pick up English very quickly. So we have a high degree of, of educational disparity. Older people, less, less so. Uh, I think that's to be expected to some degree. But what we find here when we ask Colombians, or the Census Bureau asks Colombians, what language do you speak at home? Spanish. So what this is telling us is very simple, right? This is telling us that what we're looking at here is a bilingual population. We're looking at a population that is, that is perfectly conversant in English, but chooses to speak Spanish at home. Now, I don't want to overwhelm you with data, but for example, if we looked at Puerto Rican families who've been here since the 1940s, we would be shocked to see that the majority of Puerto Rican families in the New York metropolitan area speak English at home, not Spanish. So Colombians are holding on to their language of their country. Presumably, this translates into the maintenance of culture. Right. In other words, second generations, third generations of kids who were born here, who are Americans, are still speaking Spanish. And that's a good thing. All right, I have a little hodgepodge of data to wrap this up. <clears throat> Colombians don't have very much political clout in the New York metropolitan area. And this is very simple to understand. These are people who are citizens and eligible to vote and over 18 years of age. The electorate, electorate meaning people eligible to vote in the New York metropolitan area, are 11 million. Only 111,000 Colombians can vote. So you, you can't really expect any real political clout as you would find, for example, among larger numbers of Puerto Rican voters or Dominican voters who have elected representatives to city council, the state assembly. Loves it. To find Colombian elected officials is going to be very difficult with such a small voting population here. All right. uh, another. Yeah. The picture before? Well, okay, all right, hold on. Whoa, we got to Fiend. I can't, uh, got so excited there, I just jumped in. Um, uh, this is just a, a, a breakdown that the vast majority of citizens over the age of 18 were foreign born and were naturalized. Okay. If we look at the New York metropolitan area that I'm studying here, there are 11 million eligible voters, not registered voters. That means citizens 18 years of age and older. And what I'm pointing out is essentially to reduce this to something that's a little more understandable, Colombians are less than 1% of all eligible voters in the area. And that's going to mean politically marginalization. Colombians can't expect to have a political clout within this context. This is simply numbers. Okay. Um, health insurance coverage. These are people with, this is a big issue, and the Census Bureau has just recently begun to collect data on health insurance because of uh, Obamacare and all the other uh, health insurance issues. And here, Colombians are somewhere in the middle. About, 20, about a fifth of all Colombians in the New York Metro Valley don't have health insurance. All right. More Mexicans do, more Ecuadorians do. Uh, Puerto Ricans, of course, are lower. They're American citizens from the get-go. So I think this is an issue for Colombian communities, is this issue of health insurance. Okay, and that's why I put this here. Now it's the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I will... Uh, entertain uh, accolades, compliments,
and controversial questions. Uh, professor, we're going to open the floor for five questions. Only five? All right, seven questions. <laughs> Only seven? Come on, I'm a professor. You've got to get people talk. Now, I'm just thinking about the no time. So. Questions, no long-winded speeches, declarations, although if you do have any good jokes in Spanish or English, we'll entertain yes. those, so go. All right, I'm going to give participation to people who haven't answered, answered uh, questions yet, so. Yes, uh, on the data, are you taking into account um, illegal immigrants as well? That's a very good question. <laughs> Undocumented. Undocumented students. Okay, look, Undocumented here's the deal. We don't know. We will never know. I know, I know, I know. You know, data is not ideal. We don't, we, we can't, we only can play the cards we're dealt with. That's a poker metaphor, in case some of you don't know that. I can't draw blood from a stone. I deal, I take these out, and we don't know. I don't know. Theoretically, the Census Bureau claims that undocumented people are included here. I don't think they are. There is a margin of error in any statistical study. What is that margin of error? Is it 10%? Is it 5%? Is it 15%? We don't know. We do know one thing, however, and this is important, and you're going to only pass this mini course if you're able to digest what I'm about to tell you. The margin of error is likely consistent over time. Do you know what I mean by that? I'm going to fail. It means that when we look at change between 1990, 2000, and 2010, the trends are right on and accurate because the, if there's a margin of error in 2000, if there's a margin of error in 1990, if there's a margin of error in 2010, it's probably the same. So we're looking, I'm a historian. Do you know what history is? History is very simple to understand. It's change over time. And that's what we're measuring here. We're not looking at a static view of a Colombian community. We're looking at how that community has changed, how men have changed, how women have changed, how foreign-born, domestic-born have changed over time. So the data has flaws. It's not ideal. It's the only thing we have. If you can find something else, let me know. I'll be the first in line to analyze it. Um, hi, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. I had a question about what are you, what are the next steps with the data that, and your your plans and or and you said you're lending, you're sharing it. So maybe the other co-sponsors can also talk about this or the other speakers about you know now that there's this great wealth of data, how do we continue to use it and tell the stories? Well, maybe. But that's that's really depends upon your own particular proclivities and interests and objectives. And that's when I speak, when I say that, I mean to whether you're politicians or students or professors or academics or researchers, I don't have the answer to that. I know for me, uh, look, I run a project out of my center here called the Latino Data Project. We do these detailed statistical studies of all kinds of different Latino communities, and if you access my center's website, and of course I'm giving a little plug here, we have over 60 reports on all kinds of things. So I don't know, that's gonna be up to you. What do you wanna do with this? And if someone comes to me and says, you know, Brigad, uh, this was kind of interesting, but do you think you could look at this, 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 and this, and I'll tell you, well, if the data's there, maybe. See, I can't get blood from a stone. I, I would love to know how many undocumented Mexicans there are and Colombians there are. Ain't, ain't, ain't out there. Just to add to that, we had um, um, a private breakfast with the governor of Antioquia, which visited us last week. And one of the projects is actually to go to Colombia to uh, present the project. Uh, I know the professor was really interested in doing that when we met. So we're planning to hopefully next year to visit Colombia, certain universities and uh, places where we could share that information. Here in New York, we have, if you guys look into the agendas in the back, there is an event that's happening in August, which is the Liderazgo Summit, where we will have a small presentation about the project as well to students. Um, another question here. Thank you. May we know how many Colombians are business owners or self-employee? Uh, and what kind of uh, industry or services? Thank you. 
Once again, we're facing a problem here, and the problem is this. The United States Census Bureau publishes a, a document every five years called the Survey of Business Owners. And that permits us to chart certain characteristics of who are owning businesses. That's the good news. The bad news, no such na there are no national designations. There are not, there are, what is found are lat broad groups, Latinos, non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic blacks. There's none of the kind of raw data that I can process to know that. Um, and so it's, it's problematic. Now, what I will share with you about the New York metropolitan area is that there has been an explosion of Latino-owned businesses in this region since, uh, since 1990. An absolute explosion, mostly small-scale businesses. We don't know the nationality of the ownership because the data is not there. Now, there are some ways to go into the Census Bureau records and tease out some possibilities and probabilities, but it's very, very difficult. Yeah. Well, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, I think that we had the consul here, and there will be, there will be a great thing to share this with uh, <clears throat> the Florida International University, because in the United States, the Florida International University is the only university that had a Colombian center with studies. Even CUNY doesn't have that. So I would think what, uni would what university is that? Florida International University, FIU. Oh, FIU, okay, right. So I think there will be, this, this, this study will be a great lead to be getting in contact with them. And we had the consul here to maybe do the same approach in Florida. I think that, that would be my, my proposal. And the question about the study, that thing I, don't, I didn't see here, it was the population of Colombians in jail. And, and the what, excuse me? The Colombian population that are in jail. There's no data on it. In New York, it's no data on that. There are no right. data. Just to plug in, there is a, um, the Graduate Center has a group of Colombian studies that it was the beginning of the lead of a Colombian study group within CUNY. And I know that you know about it. Um, Kalima, I don't know if you have been to the events. So um, they do have a, a group of Colombian students that are doing their PhDs that do a lot of events here at the Graduate Center. Not exactly what we're looking for, which is moving into having a, um, a, a center of, of studies of, of Colombians. But again, it has been a process. Like we could testify here, the City University of New York the Mexican community did the whole process. They did the study. They became active with the university, and then now they have their their their, their department is the study uh, of Mexican studies at Lehman College. So it's a process, of course. Any other questions? One more question. Oh, one, ladies first. I just like to make a remark uh, on your study of. Uh, that more Colombian women uh, immigrate to the United States. And I think that one of the reasons is because since, since the early 1960s, Colombian women uh, are the leading uh, students at universities. 59% women, and that, so it's 42% men at the universities. This was done uh, 10 years ago. so. I think that that one of the reasons why women, uh, when you are more educated, you are le you have less fear, and that you know that you can survive anywhere when you have a a university uh, credential. Thank you. And I would just to mention that um, Luz Daguizamo is here. Uh, the mom of John Daguizamo is here with us, and she's really active with uh, our fund now and with the Colombian community. So welcome and thank you for coming, Luz. I think it's fascinating, all the data. Can I ask you uh, an analytical question? What kind of question? Based, based on, on all this information, why do you think Colombians are not being elected, uh, 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 can elect an official elected? Can elect a politician well, in the community? Well, no, no, hold on a second, I didn't say that. Uh, I think that anyone of any national origin or any race or ethnic group can be elected to public office. 
I don't think the, the appeal, uh, uh, Carlos Manchaco was elected in a, in a district which there are very small numbers of Mexicans, and yet he is of Mexican origin. So it's not that a Colombian can't be elected, but it is a fact that especially within New York City, urban ethnic politics revolves around nationality. Now, this is a generalization which some may find, I hope not too offensive, but Dominicans vote for Dominican candidates and Puerto Ricans to vote, vote for Puerto Rican candidates in general. And that's why if you look at the city composition of the city council today in New York City, or you look at the composition of the state assembly, you have Dominican and Puerto Ricans in positions of, of power because there are large numbers of Dominicans and Puerto Ricans who are eligible to vote. And it's as simple as that. That doesn't mean that if a Colombian candidate comes along who's very talented, articulate, offers something, that people won't vote for him or her. All right, so thank you everyone for coming. And if you have more questions, you um, could direct it to the info at columbianeducationfund.org and we will be more than happy to direct it to the professor. Thank you so much. <laughs>